Good afternoon, brothers. Welcome to Phi Gamma Delta's 2022 housing conference. Uh, first, and first and foremost, I'd like to dedicate some time to thank everyone who's helped make this uh, become a reality this year. Um, I'd like to take some time to thank the members of the Housing Advisory Committee uh, who helped with the preparation and the back end of things, staff's assistance uh, on the back end, especially today with, today with the technology side, our conference partners for taking time to share the professional expertise and knowledge, and of course you, our graduate brothers and attendees. As we get started today, we have a few major highlights uh, that will be featured throughout, throughout the conference. Some of these include an update on the current status and future of the Housing Advisory Committee, a briefing and update on where the fraternity is and the future direction of the fraternity, educational table topic sessions in a round robin style. So we'll have about, we'll have four rounds of 20 minute sessions. So we encourage you to kind of jump, pick and choose wherever you can, um, you know, that, that way to get the full experience and, and get the opportunity to hear from, uh, from multiple of our presenters today. We'll have a vendor hall with our, with our presenters to learn more and interact with um, our partners and learn about their services. And then lastly, we'll have an open discussion amongst our house corporation members uh, to encourage you all to learn from one another. Now, brothers, as we move forward, I'd like to also take a moment to recognize our conference partners uh, and their representatives who are serving as our presenters for today's table topic sessions. From Upper Crust Food Services, we have Shanna Smith, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships. From Columns Fundraising, we have Mark Wilkinson, David Carrico, and Wes Wicker, all principals and partners. From Residential Capital Corp, we have Jennifer Henson, President. Omega Phi, we have Caitlin Hanna, Sales Manager. Holmes Murphy, we have Mick McGill, Vice President of Client Services and Shareholder. Morgan Nets, Client Services Consultant. And Tim Reagan, Associate Vice President of Claims. From Alpha Fraternity Management, we have Alan Lutz, Principal. CSL Management, we have Steve Ratterman, CEO and Managing Partner. And from the Callus Group, we have Matt Spearing and John Murdoch, both principals. Now, before I turn the mic over, I'd also like to briefly review today's agenda with you. We'll revisit this after our conference's opening speakers, uh, but I, I'd like to just take a moment to run through with it before we get started. So as you can see, we will have four separate breakout sessions. As we mentioned earlier, those will be 20 minute sessions in that round robin style. From 2.50 to 3.05, we'll have our vendor hall. Uh, take some time to jump around, learn and hear from our different vendors. From 3.10 to 3.45, we'll, we'll have our round table discussions. Uh, again, that, that, those will be the open discussions amongst our house, corporate, house corporation members to learn from one another. And then we'll come together at the very end for some Q&A and, and our wrap up. Now, brothers, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker uh, for today. I'd like John Ziza, uh, Ohio, 1978. John currently serves as chairman of the Housing Advisory Committee. He previously served as a director for 1848 Properties Incorporated and as a member of 1848 Housing. John has previous experience on house corporations, serving as a board member and president of the Alpha Omega House Corporation at Ohio. Professionally, John is associated with IT consulting, and holds the titles of President and CEO of the AD Agility Solutions, Inc., located in Cincinnati, Ohio. John, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dio. Welcome, everyone. And, and thank you for not only participating today, but for the work that you do uh, <clears throat> every day of every year um, for our, our local chapters. Dio, can I have the next slide, please? Um, First, I think it's important to, to provide everybody with a bit of history. As you recall, this um, last year was our first um, annual housing event, and it was sponsored by 1848 Housing. And you'll notice this year's event is, is uh, led by the Housing Advisory Committee. So what's happened is, and I'm gonna go back a couple of years. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the fraternity founded 1848 Properties which was a legal entity separate from the fraternity to house assets of chapters that have closed and to protect those assets and preserve them for those houses when they, uh, when they decide to come back on campus. As we worked as a group and worked with different house corporations, we started getting questions about house operations and we started advising um, as 1848. We started advising those house corporations. Well, um, just like BCAs and house corporations at the local level, 
it's important for the national fraternity to separate 1848 properties, which, uh, which holds assets for closed chapters from advisory roles that the, that the fraternity provides. Thus, 1848 housing was created, and that was a blend of existing uh, 1848 properties uh, board members, as well as additional members um, and an archon. And that group was structured underneath a national fraternity so that we were covered, if you will, under the umbrella uh, to be able to advise uh, chapters. Uh, over time, 1848 um, began branding itself, if you will. And it just it was just kind of uh, an event that just kind of happened um, over time. And 1848 started taking on a life of its own and started branding itself maybe a little differently than, than the fraternity. Um, and um, as well with board members from 1848 properties also serving on the advisory committee, we inadvertently created a nexus between what we had hoped to be a separate entity of properties with the housing advisory group. So the decision was taken last year to, to separate the two groups. Um, so 1848 properties still exist and still provides the same uh, functions that it, that it always has. And 1848 housing was uh, reconfigured into the housing advisory committee. Um, as a part of that process, um, we had several members retire, resign from the 1848 housing committee. Um, and myself and Mark Krill began building the new uh, housing advisory committee group. The current members of the current advisory group are J.B. Gall, Nebraska 2001, Kyle Hartman, Florida State 1999, Mark Krill, Florida 1986, Mike Lang, Ball State, 2003. Kip McDonald, Hanover, 2007. Myself and, and Dio, who is, uh, who is key for us. Dio is, is our point of contact for everything that we do and should be your point of contact as well when you have questions for us. Um, he is the person who's most available to answer a question or direct you appropriately. So I'd encourage you to, to use Dio uh, in that fashion. Before I, before I leave the, the, the member list, we're still recruiting new members. So um, unlike the 1848 Housing Committee where you couldn't be a member of an existing house corporation, the rules have changed with the Housing Advisory Committee and we welcome current and former uh, house corporation members um, into the committee. So if you have an interest, uh, let myself or Dio know um, either during the meeting or after the meeting and, uh, and we'll talk. Next slide, Dio. So our purpose in the Housing Advisory Committee is really to promote competitive housing. Um, campuses are becoming very, very competitive with us. And in some cases, trying to put us, put us out of business. And it's our goal to help you provide the best housing solutions on a consistent basis across your chapters. Um, we do this by developing house-specific house programming and by providing support to house corporations and the, IQ and the IHQ staff. Uh, unlike 1848 housing, we serve at the pleasure of the Archons and the, IQ and the headquarters staff. So we get direction from them in terms of programming um, and priorities for us to, to work on in, in, the, uh, in the year. Our sole focus is house corporations, however, um, it's been interesting over the past year, we've had a lot of undergraduate chapters reach out to us uh, asking for assistance because they have a deep interest in um, having a chapter house and maybe they are a new chapter and don't have any graduates or maybe they don't have local graduates where they're, where they're located or they don't know who their graduates are. And so what we do in those cases is, is we answer their questions and we gently guide them to the appropriate uh, persons or persons for them to, to work with, whether that be their purple legionnaire, their section chief, um, their local graduate uh, chapter, if they have one, um, or local graduates who are supporting that chapter. Dio, next slide. So our calendar for this year is are primarily four events. It's 
again, our second annual housing conference today. And we're gonna have three other quarterly events. Two will be vendor led specific town halls. And quite honestly, those can be based on the feedback that we get from you today and, and in the future regarding the priorities that you'd like to see us uh, to focus on. Um, and we will have one roundtable town hall, much the way that we will have a roundtable session at the end of the meeting today to allow you to talk to each other and for us to have an open conversation about current topics uh, relative to house corporations. Theo, next slide. So our priorities this year um, is, as I said, to rebrand 1848 uh, Properties and Housing Committee into the Housing Advisory Committee. Um, we want to review and renew our mission and vision. Um, you may have noticed that the Phi Gamma Delta website is, has begun to be updated with the Housing Advisory Committee uh, uh, data, um, and that will continue. Uh, we plan to reinstate the bi-monthly newsletters, um, something that kind of fell off the radar as we disbanded and started reorganizing at, at the end of last year. We want to continue to improve the channels of communications with the house corporations, and we'll continue to do that by directly reaching out to you and through uh, events that, that we have. Um, something that we don't have a good sense of is um, our universe of house corporations. So we really want to develop and maintain a house corporation database. Our current data suggests that we have 145 chapters. Um, and of those 145 chapters, around 92 of them have some sort of housing solution. Um, and there's all kinds of dogs and cats in terms of, of how we house our undergraduates. And that's one of those things that uh, we need to get a good handle on to make sure that we provide programming that meets the needs of all those different types of, of arrangements. We will continue, as I said earlier, to recruit committee members. Again, if you have an interest, please reach out to us. Dio, next slide. So our key projects for this year, um, and when I say projects, these are more proposals to be submitted to headquarters and the Archons for review and approval. We want to put comprehensive program together for both Pipe Burst Pro and a sprinkler system program. And what I mean by that is we just don't want to identify what, what these programs are, but we want to fully define them, help you understand the benefits, including potential insurance savings, um, and approach on how you might approach uh, one or both of, of these projects in the future as well as we, we'd like to be able to come up with some financing solutions that we can offer you as, as potential opportunities uh, for ways uh, for you all to, to get these kinds of projects executed um, in your particular house corporations. If you recall at the end of last year, maybe the middle of last year, we began working on a national insurance program and the more we dug into it, uh, the more we realized it was a bigger undertaking than we were prepared or capable of handling at the time. So at this time, the national insurance program um, is on hold. In closing, I wanna thank you all again for your continued support of your local chapters and for our vendors. Thank you for taking time. Um, some of you are maybe already pre-gaming for the Super Bowl tomorrow. Um, and for others, you're giving up time with family and friends and, and chores at home to be with us this afternoon, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, for, for those house corporations that, that are attending today, um, I want you to, to think about outsourcing um, as a means to potentially add to your staff. I, I know being a president of a house corporation, there are soft spots and there are gaps in both the skill level and the staff that you have to manage your houses. And outsourcing using, um, using our, our preferred uh, vendors uh, can be a great way to augment the, the good people that you already have and take some burden off the house corporations because some of the work that, that we do, particularly property management and food service um, accounting, those, those are things that, that can take a lot of effort um, and, and can be areas where, where you may fall behind in, in your service delivery. I, I can tell you from personal experience, one of the first things that I did when I was the House Corps president was I outsourced accounting. 
Um, and that was the best thing that I ever did. Um, the books are always up to date. We can see them online along with, with our accountant. Um, bills are paid on a timely basis. Our treasurer can now focus on budgeting and finance and not day-to-day -day bookkeeping. Um, and, and that's a big deal and it's, it's a huge burden. In addition, it makes transition when treasurers move on and move off the board, it really makes that, trans that transition much more smooth. Um, so as, again, as you think about um, your situation and listen to our, our vendors speaking today, look for opportunities where um, they may be able to provide you with a valuable service. Th th those are my comments for today. Thank you. And at this time, I'm going to pass it off to our fearless leader, Rob Cadill, who's going to provide us with the state of the fraternity. Thank you, John. And uh, brothers, welcome again. Uh, on, on behalf of the, the fraternity, I do I, again want to emphasize how much we appreciate what, what you are all doing, each, each one of you, to support housing in Phi Gamma Delta, uh, to, take, to take time out of your day, out of your weekend, uh, to really work to, to support undergraduate housing and dedicating your time to a cause you believe in. And it's been said already, but I do want to reiterate as well um, my thanks to the, the Housing Advisory Committee, particularly John Ziza, uh, for their, their work, particularly the last uh, year or so, in taking on some, some big efforts to, to rethink and reimagine our approach as it relates to supporting our house corporations. So with that, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking with you today on uh, some, some fairly important topics that aren't necessarily purely related to housing, but uh, good, good to understand and know as you contemplate what's, what's next or what's in store for your, uh, your chapter facilities. So I'm gonna focus my question, or I'm gonna focus my time on three W's, right? Uh, a, a why and, and, two where, and two where are we's, right? So the why is always important. And that's, that's a piece I think we all need to think about a lot more of. Uh, why is it that we're doing the things that we're doing? Why, why are these things important? So I, I do want to start there, and if you'll give me one second, I'm going to start walking you through a few things here. So I want to talk today about why is why is this work important? Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time giving you a, a bit of an update as to where we are today, where Phi Gamma Delta sits, where, where we stand, some of the successes, some of the challenges we've seen in, in recent times. Uh, but I think most importantly, and most importantly for you as, as graduate leaders in the fraternity, uh, start to help you see and understand where we're going as, as an organization. So now I assume you're here because you had, uh, either you had or you believe in the importance of the fraternity experience, right? You have fond memories uh, of your undergraduate experience, your graduate experience. And see, the interesting thing is that for many, many years, we've been in the position of believing this. Many of us believe that wholeheartedly, right? But it's been tough to really show it, right? Or show in a, in a real in a pure way, in an empirical way. So we are now in a position uh, more recently that we can, we can take that position and more empirically prove some of the positive impacts that fraternity and fratern the fraternity experience has on undergraduate men in particular. So the why, and I'm gonna share with you a little bit of interfraternal research, right? Uh, the why. Research proves that fraternities foster a positive mental health, serve as a success accelerator for students, and engender tremendous loyalty and connection uh, among alumni to support their alma mater, right? That's a phrase you might have heard me say before uh, if you've listened to me in the last, I don't know, six or eight months, uh, and a phrase I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more, and, and there's a reason for that. We're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to help everybody to get that to stick. Phi Gamma Delta has been working hand in hand with our interfraternal friends uh, and through the North American Interfraternity Conference, the NIC, to undertake a number of research projects to start to really truly understand the, the benefits and, and proving the benefits of the fraternity experience, as well as identify our shortcomings and better understand how we can address those. So we certainly believe that there is tremendous experience, or tremendous benefit to the experience, and this is only the beginning of the research. So what I'm, what I'm going to walk you through are kind of three key areas of findings, and understand that these are based on about five or six different projects. And I'm just encapsulating 
uh, key thoughts in, in these categories. And I'll, I'll point to a few of the specifics and show you where you can uh, where you can learn a bit more if you're interested. So, the first area, right? One of the, one of the interesting things we've that we've found over the last uh, 12 or 18 months, uh, which really isn't surprising when you think about it, is that fraternity mem the fraternity member experience uh, fosters stronger mental health and wellness, right? So while, co while college men are experiencing loneliness and depression at increasingly rates, fraternities empower students to create a strong support system. This family, this home away from home, that fraternities provide offers connection and can create a strong sense of belonging, uh, leading members to have a more positive mental health and less anxiety and depression, right? These are all important things. So let me share with you a few key, key items that have come up in the research. Um, by, by measures I won't get into the, the full explanation of, right, fraternity members do, empirically proven, do uh, report higher levels of positive mental health and have less depression or, or anxiety than their, uh, than their peers, than their unaffiliated peers. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a real positive thing to see. And you start to think, well, why is that? Well, there's, there's some things we're gonna come back to on that. In addition to that, nearly 80% of fraternity men report excellent to good mental health and well-being another positive sign. Here's, here's some of the why and some of the things we've been able to, to uh, pull out of here as well. And that when members really seek out help, they're twice as likely to turn to a brother uh, than anyone else. There is that built-in support network that fraternity fosters. And uh, our members tend to believe that, that, good, that good support systems exist, uh, not just within their chapters, but on their campuses. And they tend to be more connected to those networks to get help when they need it, right? So that's... Uh, that environment where members can have those tough conversations and really, really be there for each other for those, those personal issues that may arise uh, is, is really beneficial in the fraternity experience. We've also come to learn that fraternities are what we call an excess, a success, 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 <laughs> success accelerator, say that three times fast, uh, both in college and beyond, right? We know that students spend a lot of time outside of the classroom. Some will say up, upwards of 90% outside of the classroom. And fraternities really capitalize on those hours by preparing men for success in college and in their futures far beyond what their peers experience. Now, these results in particular, most of these uh, go back to a key study conducted by Gallup uh, fairly recently, in which actually was, was actually uh, conducted back in 2014 and then replicated. So we're seeing these good results over time, which, which makes a stronger case for us uh, again. But this study, which included thousands and thousands, about 14,000 uh, alumni of diverse background, uh, shows that uh, this, this assumption uh, really does hold true, regardless of an individual's background or socio socioeconomic status entering into college. So some key takeaways from that. 83% of members, 83% of fraternity members indicate stronger leadership confidence as a result of their fraternity membership. They come out of that experience much uh, much more able to tackle the world and, and take on leadership roles uh, after college, which is an important thing uh, that we look at. We also know that fraternity members show significantly higher learning gains than their peers in their first year of college, right? That's important when we think about that. We think about uh, the different ways uh, that, and I should, I should say that learning gains are measured in, in more ways than just GPAs, right? But um, when, when men are in, the men, men in particular in, in their first year of college, uh, those gains are significantly higher when they're uh, included in fraternity membership. So there's, there's something right there about, it, particularly in those early phases, getting engaged and, and having a group to really help you uh, be accountable and focus on your college work. And despite being less diverse than students in general, fraternity and sorority members do report higher levels of interaction with people different than themselves than do other students, right? So we, we know that there's been a lot of talk uh, and, and a lot of focus and a lot, and a lot of needed discussion around uh, diversity or lack of diversity and, and equity and inclusion concerns in some organizations. But as, as we think about the why behind that, it's, it's a different world that we're getting into, right? And we know that, that our, our students, our men and, and our women as well, uh, when they come out of the fraternity experience, they are more accustomed to having those interactions with people who are, who are not like themselves which also better prepares them for the world uh, in front of them. 
Uh, moving on a little bit, and just to give you a few more key stats and, and, and things to feel good about. We know that fraternity alumni are twice as likely to feel that their alma mater prepared them for life after college and that they gain important job-related skills. So put, put your professional hat on here for a minute, you know, scanning the, scanning the Zoom screen. Uh, I'm making the assumption many, many of us here are in a position where we, we hire uh, folks. You hear a lot of grumbling about how prepared students are for college today. As we think about the fraternity experience and, and the importance of some of these things, um, really, uh, really being able to instill good people skills, soft skills, those things that, that uh, when you're hiring, you love to see, but are hard to, can be hard to teach is very important uh, going into the future here as well. We also know that fraternity alumni or graduates are twice as likely to, to feel that their alma maters prepare them for life after college, right? And uh, they're, they're more quickly finding jobs after graduation. They're more engaged in the workplace. So overall, what this is starting to show us is that fraternity membership, uh, men and, and women who have graduated from college, after, so after college, those first several years, they are more likely to be thriving in, in every aspect of well-being that Gallup uh, studied. Uh, that's related to career, related to community, uh, financial, physical, and social well-being in every respect for members of fraternity and sororities are in, in a better position and they're more likely to be thriving than their non-affiliated peers. This is important for us to understand and know. You know, the last area is that uh, we, we also know and we believe that fraternities create lifelong connection to the campus, the community, and their peers, right? Those things that we, we feel uh, and, and probably could exhibit for uh, the last several years. We know that our members are more engaged inside and outside the classroom than their peers and that they report feeling much more connected uh, to their faculty, which is an important uh, sign of learning, and nearly half serve in leadership roles across campuses, right? But beyond just the campus connection, we also know that fraternity and sorority membership uh, helps these students be more connected to their local communities, and they spend significantly more time volunteering than non-affiliated students. Some of the key stats that come out of this, 75% of fraternity members demonstrate a strong satisfaction, a strong satisfaction with their overall student experience. So they come out of school saying, this was, th this was, this was important for me. And uh, as, as campuses look at, at different things and, and retention and their own alumni engagement, they certainly take notice of that. We also know that 78% of fraternity members feel a strong connection to campus and are overall more satisfied with their experience. Not shocking, right? Fraternity members are more involved in, in co-curricular, extracurricular activities and, and membership that ultimately promotes student leadership and development, as well as satisfaction with that experience. Yeah, we talked about that one. And I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but again, um, we recognize these are, are, are generally, generally well known and assumed, but can, are proven. Uh, fraternity members do spend significantly more time volunteering, mentoring, and doing other types of service work. You know, they're really embodying, in, in our world, they're embodying that value of service and giving back to the local communities. Oh, and over, overall, they are, are much more engaged. So I think, you know, the, the kicker there beyond just the, the engagement factor is, you know, it really helps to build uh, not just good members, not just, in our case, good men, but good, good world citizens which I think is an aim of, of all organizations like ours. And I think the, the kicker that I don't have uh, up in here in front of you here, but uh, one of the interesting questions that was posed or key findings uh, came out of that, that said, if they had to do it, oh, if they had to do college all over again, so this is alumni after they graduated, if they had to do it all over again, more than eight out of 10 fraternity members would rejoin their organizations, right? So that, that's, a sign, that's a sign of overall, overall positive movement as to how things are going within fraternities and sororities. So what I wanna talk about now is, uh, you know, we, we hit on the why, right? Why, why do we do the work we do? Because we believe in, in the positive fraternity experience. I certainly do. I assume that you do as well, or you would probably not be doing, uh, doing what you're doing today. Um, but I wanna talk about a little bit what, where we are now and then where we're going next. So where we are now, a few items just, just by the numbers. As it stands today, this minute, updated this morning, uh, Phi Gamma Delta uh, has just over 9,500, in fact, it's 9,501 is the exact number, undergraduate members uh, on 145 campuses across North America. How does that compare? I get that question a lot. Um, every year, there's an annual survey 
uh, uh, done, facilitated by a uh, professional association for fraternities. Uh, so in terms of overall membership, Phi Gamma Delta ranks about ninth, so in, in the top 10 out of about 60 plus uh, men's organizations, and um, overall 14th in terms of number of campuses. So Phi Gamma Delta, by and large, has much, has much larger chapters, average chapter size than, than a lot of our peers, uh, but still, uh, still holding our own in, in a lot of respects. But we know the undergraduate experience is only a small part of the overall fraternity experience, right? So to keep adding those numbers, Phi Gamma Delta today, 132,000, it's actually about 132,400-ish living graduate members. Uh, and uh, we, we actually passed a milestone not that long ago, uh, but as it stands today, 203,000 uh, and if 203,000 initiates over the last 173 years. So 203,000 men have joined Phi Gamma Delta. Of those 132,000 living graduates, uh, we, we know that we have about 1,800, uh, about 1,800 brothers who serve in various volunteer roles, right? So that's everything from house corporation members and purple legionnaires and section chiefs and BCA members like, like we have on the call today as well as uh, brothers in other roles from various fraternity committees, uh, archons and appointed general officers. So about 1800 brothers, uh, at least in our records. Uh, so probably more out there that we, we don't we have not heard of yet uh, are, are actively giving giving their time to Phi Gamma Delta, which is uh, which is fantastic to see and a great embodiment of our uh, our motto of being not for college days alone. I want to point out something because I, I get the question a lot. Well, you know, the last two years had to have done something to us, right? I think at, at this point last year, we were still talking about a lot of what ifs and how did, how did things play out with, uh, with COVID-19? What, what was the impact for us? Let me, let me show you a little snapshot of the past, uh, I think it's about six or seven years. So you can see how Phi Gamma Delta's undergraduate membership, and again, this is just undergraduate membership, has uh, peaked and valleyed a little bit. Uh, since about 2015. So these, these measurements are taken at the end of, of, of each of our fiscal years, so it, essentially at June 30th every year. And you can see that our, our peak membership our, in terms of undergraduate members uh, was just above 12,000 on June 30th, 2019. Uh, that was fairly steady from 2018. Uh, and you can also see in terms of number of chapters, we actually peaked on that one in, on June 30th, 2017. Now the true peak was 167. Uh, that, that happened um, sometime between June 30th, 2017 and, and June 30th, 2018. So at our peak, our, our largest membership ever in terms of chapters, we were at 167. Uh, unfortunately, we've not maintained that the past two years, and, and that's pretty evident by what you see today. Again, peaking from 167, we are on 145 campuses today. We've seen significant attrition uh, and there is a, an error here. I, I see that on my graph that that number is 145, not 146. Um, we have seen some, some attrition. Uh, that's certainly a, a significant number of that, a sig significant amount of that attrition has been due to behavior and, and the need to close chapters for behavioral issues and, and concerns. You know, COVID-19 also had an impact. We, we did lose a handful of chapters uh, due, to the, due, due to the pandemic and not being able to sustain membership, right? So for example, uh, right when the pandemic began, there were uh, two colonies that had just started uh, the spring before. So it had just started uh, in early 2020 and just did not have their feet under them well enough to really be able to pivot as a way a more established chapter might uh, to, to sustain themselves. And overall, you know, obviously, you can see the big jump from 19 to 20, uh, losing about 1,200 members, 1,100 members. Um, some of that is attributed to chapter closures, right? There were some, some chapter closures during that time, uh, behavioral, not just COVID-19, but behavioral. Uh, but, but you know, on average, on average, chapters did, did lose some members throughout, throughout the pandemic. Some, there were some winners and losers and all that. Uh, I think when we sorted it all out, we, we attributed probably about a 10% membership hit uh, to the pandemic. Uh, though that's, 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 I would not call that a hard stat. There, there's a lot more that would need to be sorted out to, to fully understand that. Uh, and our membership has, has not, uh, not quite rebounded yet, as we've unfortunately had to close a, a number of chapters still uh, since 2020 and into 2021 and now 2022. Uh, uh, you can see where, where our trends are going. So 
Uh, all that being said, you know, Pagan Melta is still in, in a healthy position. Uh, overall, uh, our, our membership is, is healthy and stable, but there are, there are some things that we, we know we need to address. And you know, with that, um, I think it's important to point out that we know that we know about the importance and the value of the fraternity experience, but we have to acknowledge our faults. Fraternity cannot shine at its brightest when it's dimmed by the depraved actions of a few. Okay. We can't ignore what's out there. Many of you have seen, experienced, read, questioned some of the media headlines, particularly over the last eight or 12 months. And, and I'm sure I have questions around what's going on. Well, if I Gamma Delta is going to truly unite men in during friendships, stimulate the pursuit of knowledge, and build courageous leaders who serve the world with the best that is in them. Brothers, we have to admit that we're at a significant testing point. We cannot ignore the damage to our organization, to our men, uh, to our reputation that's occurred in recent times. There's a black eye that fraternity has, fraternities have certainly earned. And the serious issues that we must tackle, those self-inflicted wounds, particularly related to alcohol misuse, sexual misconduct, and hazing, those are, those are items we've, we've got to deal with head on. And quite frankly, we, we need everyone's help in doing so. Because despite our best intentions, we have to understand that our actions really define us. And our actions or inactions today will certainly define Phi Gamma Delta and the fraternity experience for many, many years to come. Although we're an organization with a deep, rich history and storied and traditions, as you look across our 173, almost 174 years of history, you recognize too that there have been many evolutions through those years. There have been significant changes which the fraternity adapted to, not only to remain relevant, but to thrive in a changing world around us. I believe, we won't know for some time, but I believe that when we, when we look back at this era, decades from now, when we look back, we will view this period as a transformational time. We'll view this period as a time when we, when we as an organization made courageous choices and made changes to ensure that we flourish in the future. This will be a time when we saw that we radically rethought and reimagined many aspects of what's familiar with the end result being the ensuring of that positive membership experience that the fraternity has on a man for many, many years to come. So brothers, with that in mind, I, I want to lay out for you uh, some details about where we're headed. The Archons have identified four overarching strategic objectives, uh, which were announced at our most recent Fiji Academy. I want to share with those with you now and, and with an added promise that you're going to be seeing more and hearing more detail about these uh, in the near future. Um, I say we're first developed the Fiji Academy, um, largely because they were not really cemented <laughs> until the Friday of the Fiji Academy. So under, uh, understand the staff and the Archons are working uh, to, to build, some, uh, build some backbone here and, and start really the communications of, of where we're going. And uh, I hope, I'm gonna help to do that for you today. So the Archons identified four overall uh, strategic objectives. So I'm gonna outline each of them for you and then walk you through each of these in a little bit more detail. First, we believe that we need to eliminate hazing and all forms of self-destructive behaviors, those self-inflicted wounds, those things which damage us most, okay? We also need that we need to work to enhance the undergraduate membership experience to ensure that that experience is relevant uh, and, and really works to provide that positive experience for years and years to come. We understand with that too, that it's not just the undergraduate experience. We need to improve our volunteer and organizational effectiveness in order to provide the, the support that's needed and adapt, adapt to where we are today and, and what's needed both by our undergraduate members and our graduate leaders, our graduate members. And finally, we, need, we believe that we need to continue to strengthen Phi Gamma Delta with, with what we call a smart growth philosophy. Okay, so those are the four. Let me walk you through them just a little bit. I'm just checking how much time I have. I'm doing good. So, we talk about self-destructive behaviors, right? When we chart our new chapter, I spent a lot of time helping our newest brothers understand the lessons of our history, our opportunities and our threats, our triumphs and our failures, right? The primary lesson is, is to learn that we've had many external threats over the years. 
but ultimately those external threats are relatively few and minor compared to the threats that we impose upon ourselves. So when I talk about those external threats, right, think about all the things that have happened in the world around us in the past 100, 173 years. We've endured world wars, economic collapses, significant shifts in higher educations, now more than one global pandemic. Uh, history shows us that we persist and oftentimes come out stronger than when we started uh, looking at each of these events. But there are a number of e internal threats, those self-inflicted wounds, behavior, stubbornness and unwillingness to change. Those threats, those things which we do to ourselves have a much more significant and deep impact on our membership as a whole. That trend is borne out over time as you, as you track our membership and going through different eras in history. So with, with that in mind, uh, the Archons have identified several key initiatives under this, this overarching objective. First and foremost is con to continue our role to educate and help undergraduates make smart and right decisions, particularly when it matters most around alcohol misuse, hazing, and sexual misconduct. Phi Gamma Delta provides a heck of a lot of, of programming and resources. We look to continue to strengthen and evolve those and, and find good partners along the way uh, to help us really get, get those key messages across. Uh, men, men who are between the ages of 18 and 22, we know that it takes a lot of coaching, a lot of mentoring, and a lot of education. So those, 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 can, those are not one and done efforts, right? Those are, those are continual for sure. But beyond just the education, we know that there are some more structural things that we need to address. We believe that we need to really think about very strongly the entire approach and process to what we call becoming a Phi Gamma and be a little bit more innovative in, in how we tackle this. We believe that we need to rethink and redesign that process, which is really borne out through this and other objectives that I'll hit on here uh, this afternoon. So first and foremost, it's really time to go back to our roots with recruitment and give our chapters, make sure our chapters have the tools that they need to really to do the evaluation of a man before he joins, before he's given that, bed, that bid, and ultimately select men who will strengthen our chapters as a whole. That values-based recruitment, uh, it, it, all, it all starts there, right? It's also time to really shift the focus on new member education. And that's done today by a program uh, some of you have, have started to hear about for sure, and that's called uh, Foundation of Courage. This is the fraternity's revised approach, new approach to new member education. It focuses on building strong relationships as our newest members join, uh, focuses on, on, on those relationships and uh, squashing some of the misnomers that, you know, there's a lot of information you have to memorize to be a, big, to be a good brother, right? Uh, a lot of our, our new member education practices that have been put in place for several years focused on what, re what re really resembles a history course and memorizing a textbook. We've missed out on really building the, the relationships in a strong and productive way. And that's what Foundations of Courage really focuses on. Now, all this is bookended by uh, another program, which is in a pilot phase now called Built to Lead. And it, it, will, it will roll out more broadly over the course of the next year but really built to lead seeks to elongate the learning and involvement in the fraternity, ultimately providing a framework to build good men, good citizens, and courageous leaders. All of our members, all of our undergraduates, all of our graduate members are gonna be hearing a lot more about our thinking, our approach, our, our, our testing, our, what we're learning about new approaches to, to the joining process. We believe this is one, one of these areas that we, we have to tackle hard and have to make some big strides and to modernize and match where we are today. In this area, we also believe that we need to uh, really promote and strengthen chapter level accountability. You know, uh, a core lesson of fraternity really is working with and holding your brothers accountable, right? I think, I can, I think we can all agree to that. That's, that's a core lesson that we work to instill as a part of a chapter, something you think hold comes fairly naturally. But all, all of this we're talking about is fairly moot. All of these, these efforts to mitigate the bad behavior is really moot if our undergraduates are not willing to challenge one another to live by our values and prepare them for life after graduation. So we need to work to be a little bit more intentional and to really support uh, and, and help our undergraduates be bold in having those tough conversations with each other. 
we believe we need to strengthen, <clears throat> excuse me, strengthen the role of, of graduate advisors in education and mentoring. Now we recognize that it's difficult for undergraduates to accomplish this alone. So we need the help and, and support of our graduates who are involved with our chapters. And more importantly, we, the international fraternity, need to make sure that we are providing the tools uh, that those graduates need to be fully equipped to help our chapters succeed in those efforts. <clears throat> in, a, in all this, we, we recognize that uh, Phi Gamma Delta Archons staff and key graduates, uh, as we talk about today, that we're, we're not the only ones with, with skin in the game uh, and, and not the only ones who have influence. So we, we need to work to better engage and active, actively engage parents to leverage their role in promoting these safe and healthy environments as well. <clears throat> Our next objective is, is again, talking about um, continuously and actively working to enhance the undergraduate experience. You know, so first by eliminating those self-destructive behaviors that we've talked about, but, but also proactively working to promote and, and accentuate those positive experiences and membership outcomes that we know exist. So in this, we recognize that building courageous leaders is at the center of that undergraduate experience, right? That comes out particularly in that program I just mentioned, Built to Lead, uh, which is designed to create a resume worthy four-year leadership program based on those building courageous leader principles. Again, that, that program and pilot phase is set to be offered and available to more chapters throughout the coming year. And we're gonna need your help. We're gonna need our graduates help uh, to attract our undergraduates to, to this idea and, and help to get some buy-in. Uh, it takes a little bit of work, uh, but ultimately, ultimately puts them in, in a much better position down the line. You know, and, and in that, it's not just focusing on, on the overall leadership program uh, uh, around those principles, but emphasizing those and how do we best emphasize those to our elected officers and educate and, pre and prepare all influence, all influencers at the undergraduate level, all non-elected cha chapter leaders, right? Those informal influencers to really prepare them to be bold. We recognize that we need to anticipate our undergraduates' expectations and their changing expectations and respond accordingly. You know, we've, we, have, we have systems in place where we're, we're beginning to better understand what our undergraduates really want and need. And ultimately we'll work from there to provide tools for our chapters to adapt and thrive in this changing environment around us. We believe that an important piece of the undergraduate membership experience is to promote inclusion, which is really a core tenet of our value of friendship. And, and also increase diversity within Phi Gamma Delta to reflect our host institutions, right? Um, if you weren't aware, if you had not heard, uh, Phi Gamma Delta did commission a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, which sent back to the Archons a number of recommendations, which we are beginning to implement today. Uh, those efforts are encapsulated in a couple buckets, right? Uh, how do we best educate our members on the importance and the value of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our chapters? How do we prepare, or I'm sorry, provide an undergraduate and graduate focused resources to assure that success? How do we create the structures and responsibilities in our chapters to really help support inclusion? And again, I think so inclusion is, is the big piece here uh, because ultimately it's to support that inclusion which lends itself better to diversity, equity, and belonging down the line. And again, all this is, is, a, is a mechanism to better reflect the world around us. As we sit, as we look at it today, uh, Phi Gamma Delta is assumed to be roughly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, our undergraduates, because we have the data, uh, roughly 80%, 20% non-white, non-Hispanic. The widely uh, cited example for college campuses as a whole, and this varies significantly campus to campus, as it does for our own, our own chapter to chapter, is that 40% of students are non-Hispanic, non-white. Right. Our goal is to better, better resemble our host institutions and the world around us and to put those processes in place to break down barriers and, and be a, the inclusive organization that our value of friendship really commands us to be. Uh, other, other items in this area is to create and promote new opportunities for chapters to give back to their campuses and community through service and philanthropy. Admittedly, a lot of our chapters do this really well. Some of our chapters struggle, and the pandemic has thrown this all for a loop. So we've got a lot of chapters learning from uh, learning uh, from from scratch again. Uh, so it's it's really promoting those opportunities for chapters to really show what they can do 
be that be that big bold force and support the community around them. And we also believe that an important part of this undergraduate experience is, is supporting those improved housing standards by our house corporations, right? We know that the chapter house does not make the chapter, right? We understand that. Um, in fact, as, as John correctly illustrated earlier, uh, you know, about, about a third, a little bit more than a third actually of our chapters are not housed. But where, where there is chapter housing, we want to really work to ensure that those, those chapter facilities uh, are a good supplement and good complement to the fraternity experience, as opposed to the anchor that might be around the chapter's neck or in any, in any way detract from it. So it's working with the housing advisory committee and ultimately house corporations to ensure we've got the, the tools, the standards in place uh, to have housing that really helps fraternity thrive. As we move, we move forward into the future, we also need to be sure that our supporting structure, and particularly our graduates who care so much and are willing to support our undergraduates, is right for the next 173 years. I think we, we've got to recognize, well, again, an organization steeped in tradition, we've got to take a hard look at, at, a, at an organizational structure that hasn't made a whole lot of shifts or moves in at least 40 or 50 years, right? We've got to really assess and evaluate where we sit to be sure that we've got the right systems in place going forward. So a first step in here is, is to do just that, to review and adjust our organizational structure and roles, volunteer roles, responsibilities, and involvement, ultimately to modernize and accomplish our most critical goals. How do we get the support there? How do we help the brothers who were there to support our graduates? How do we help them uh, help our chapters the most and build, us, build the strongest fraternity we possibly can? We also recognize that we need to establish mechanisms for measuring effectiveness and success, right? It's not enough that roles are filled, but we've got to actively work to measure effectiveness and success, continue to adapt, thus better supporting our chapters, and let's not, let's not let this point be lost, make the graduate volunteer experience more fulfilling, right? It's not just checking a box or having, having a body in a seat. How do, we, how do we make each of the roles and support each of the roles in a way uh, so that the undergraduate chapter receives what it needs and the, the graduate walks away saying, I did something good here. I can feel good about myself with this. In all this, we know we need to work to amplify success. We don't, we don't do enough to share successes that, that we all have, right? We've made, we've made an example, we made it a point in, even in our, our weekly staff meetings. I say, tell me something good today. We don't amplify the successes nearly enough. We need, we need to showcase that but also help everyone understand uh, and learn those lessons that, that we, we have in terms of those failures. We need to share those experiences with one another and ultimately recognize that as, as an organization, we need to improve the communication that we have to our graduate volunteers concerning those most critical issues. We need to be more clear, more direct and, and be able to say, this is what we need, this is where we need it, this is why we need you to help us with it. Brothers, to round us out here, I, I wanna, uh, finalized with our, our smart growth. You know, growth is good. Growth is healthy. Uh, but smart growth utilizes the tools and information that, to us that we have today that we've not enjoyed in the past to really propel our fraternity into the future. So a big piece of this is a, something I already spoke to, and that's really to modernize undergraduate recruitment in order to better attract and select quality, quality men. You might hear us start to talk about something called the growth system, right? Uh, that's that, that's a system that's, that's in the works and in place and, and, and rolling out today uh, that really does, does all that. It leverages the technology available. It leverages a ton of tools uh, that undergraduates have available to them to make recruitment, uh, uh, to make recruitment flow better, right? Um, to really be able to evaluate, do the evaluation that they, that they need of membership and to ultimately attract the, the highest quality men possible. We recognize too that we need to use data-driven decisions to both grow, strengthen, and, and close our chapters and colonies. Um, there's a lot of information that we have uh, that can help us make those decisions, even when they're difficult. But those smart decisions ultimately make us stronger in the future. And of course, we want to continue to expand the influence of Pike and Delta using campus selection criteria that determine the best potential for success, right? We know we need to, to continue to grow, to add chapters, to bring chapters back that we've lost, but we've got to do that in the right way and at the right time. Um, 
so it, it's it's continuing those efforts there and, and being uh, being consistent in our approach and doing so, ultimately to continue to thrive and put Phi Gamma Delta in in the best position possible. Well, brothers, um, I again want to thank you for the important work that you are that you are already doing to support Phi Gamma Delta and your dedication to providing housing to undergraduate chapters. I do look forward to your assistance as we move the fraternity forward and work to ensure a continuing positive impact for many, many years to come. Brothers, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to either John or Dio to tell you about where we're going next. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, John. Uh, brothers, we'll share my screen real quick. So as we continue the conference, I encourage you to use your conference program. That's where you will find all the available links for all the upcoming table topics, roundtable discussions, and closing session. Up next, starting at 1.10, our table topic sessions will start. You will have the option to choose from one of six available sessions in the conference program itself. Each of those sessions is listed under table topic four. Each of those links, uh, all the same links will be used for all four sessions. So please reference that listing um, for the next hour and a half or so. After that, we'll jump into our vendor hall where you all have the opportunity to jump around, ask questions and freely engage with all of our conference partners and, and their representatives. Then we'll round out with some round table discussions, allow all of our attendees to jump into two groups, uh, those with facilities of less than 50 members, living capacity and those with more than 50 members. Those discussions will also have members of the Housing Advisory Committee being a part of it to help facilitate um, and, and offer advice um, and guidance as needed. And lastly, brothers, we'll come together for, for a closing. We'll recap some resources available to US House Corporation members or as graduate volunteers for local chapters. And we'll answer any questions that you all may have. So brothers, thank you all again for being in attendance for this year's housing conference. Our next session will begin in about 10 minutes. So feel free to uh, look around the conference program, take some time for yourself, take a little break before we get started. Uh, but our next session will start in about 10 minutes. So thank you all and we'll see you then.